Okay, it appears that uh, we're back in the middle of winter time again. Uh, I know the last video I was talking about uh, enjoying a little bit better weather, and it seems like uh, now it's decided to turn off freezing cold again. It's almost like that meme. Uh, I've seen it on social media before where you have the owl and he's surrounded by sunshine and he says spring has finally arrived and then in the lower picture he's he's covered in snow and it says no it is not and, it, and that's kind of what's going on here. March is very capricious uh, right now. Uh, I, according to the 10 day weather forecast I'm supposed to see some more warmth and sunshine or whatever and like I said in the last couple last video you know I'm, I'm over the, the winter uh, but I decided I had some downtime again I decided I'd make another one of these and uh, there was something that crossed my mind uh, on my day off I was watching uh, what I thought was one of the best mob movies, uh, in my opinion, everybody's got a different take on which, what the best one was, but it was Donnie Brasco. Uh, I thought Al Pacino was just great in that, you know, as Lefty. There's a one scene that I really like where in the very beginning, when they're arguing about this diamond, whether it's real or not, he's like, you know, you know who you're talking to? I'm known, I'm known, I'm known all over freaking Mulberry Street. Everybody knows who Lefty is. There's a just brilliant scene. I just like that but the uh the one scene that stuck out when i was watching it uh this time around it had been a few years since i had seen it there's a scene where johnny depp is arguing with his wife and she says you're becoming just like them and he says in a really dramatic uh turn of events he says no i am them uh but it got me to thinking about something that gives just kind of an inkling in the back of my mind uh that kind of gave me the idea for this video uh to take a little bit off the last video I made about uh, feeling like a normal person again when, you know, I, I was working in a supermarket after leaving AA, there was something uh, that I kind of thought about a little bit, and it was something that I was not really consciously aware of at the time it was happening uh, during my 11, 12 years in the cult. But it had to do with the with the language and the thought processes that I started to develop during that time period, uh, the way I talked, the way I approached the world, and uh, uh, to issue out another thing about the, the video I made about pop culture in AA, in AA meetings, in the movies, uh, the person is always speaking in very ordinary, everyday terms. Uh, they say something like, this week I'm having a hard time with my uh, with my job and there's communications that's difficult with my children about this situation. It's very ordinary everyday language. In reality, when you're in an AA meeting, nobody talks like everyday ordinary people. They speak in cliches, they speak in slogans, uh, and it's really kind of hard to describe if, if you haven't been to a whole lot of meetings. Uh, if you've been to any meetings, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you're sharing about a problem, it's almost a contest to see how many slogans and how many cliches you can throw in uh, during your share. You know, you might say something like, well, I'm having a tough week this week, but I have to keep in mind that it's one day at a time and go, nothing happens in God's world by mistake. And, uh, you know, it's like my sponsor says, there's no way to think your way into right action. And, you know, you're not speaking actually directly from the heart, which is funny because they talk about rigorous honesty, but there's nothing honest about... <clears throat> about what you're doing in an AA meeting. You're speaking in AA lingo. It's almost like a language unto itself. And I didn't realize uh, how much of that got incorporated into my everyday language, but even worse, I didn't realize how much of that was in my uh, ordinary thought processes as well. Uh, there were certain things that would pop up in everyday life and I'd say something like you know to myself I wouldn't say this out loud but I would think to myself something like well you know that's that's what happens when you have terminal uniqueness that's a big AA thing uh, it implies that we're not unique that we're all since we're all supposedly alcoholics that we all think and act exactly the same which is complete and utter nonsense or I would think to myself, well, you know, uh, it's just one day at a time. Or I would say to myself, well, I need to fake it till I make it. Or I would say to myself, you know, I need to act as if. 
Uh, or I'd say something like, well, you know, that's what happens when you're coming to believe in a power greater than yourself. You know, it's, it was all cliched slogans and they were all rotating around and rolling around in my head. And I realized they were influencing and coloring my perceptions, uh, my thought processes, and even, even kind of the way I carried myself uh, to some degree. There was certain things I remember saying in meetings that I would say in everyday ordinary uh interactions with people and, and I look back on it now and I really cringe you know at the thought of it uh, but it there was a philosopher I don't remember who he was I don't remember which one it was but he said we are what we repeatedly do and it it, it, it got me to thinking about the fact that when you're in the AA cult religion uh, it, it separates you from the rest of society in one way they'll tell you you know, well, we can't possibly be a cult because you can leave at any given time that you want to, even though they put a lot of death threats in your head about it. You know, those who leave will drink themselves to death to die. There's no other way out for people with an addiction like ours because, you know, it's jails, institutions of death, things of that nature. They'll also tell you that you don't have, you can have ordinary jobs, that you don't live on a compound, uh, that they don't control your finances and things of that nature. But that's, on the surface, that's one thing, but when you're actually inundated into the the actual religious cult itself, it's quite another. Uh, they encourage a very ugly type of mentality that I see even in ordinary, in the real world here with, with say, like politics uh, is a good example of it, or religions. Uh, uh, especially if you're like me, uh, when it comes to politics, I have very, very nuanced views of things, I guess would be the proper word I'm looking for. Uh, I don't necessarily fit into one category because I think every situation or every single issue should be looked at and objectively examined. And I'm not saying I, I, I'm some, I'm, I'm not saying I'm somebody like uh, Spock in Star Trek that's pure logic when he's looking at a situation. I'm not implying that I don't have my own biases and perceptions as well, but I'm just saying I, I've never liked this idea of just blindly uh, following along, uh, you know, with one particular group or another, probably because I experienced so much of that in my religious upbringing, which I no longer, you know, cling to those notions, but I also experienced that in AA really strongly. There's a very strong us versus them mentality in AA, and when you have the us versus them mentality, uh, then you, t you generally have this idea that, you know, this is my team, this is my organization, this is my religion, this religion can never be wrong, everything they say cannot be flawed, and if it is flawed, it's still okay because it's not as bad as them over there. Uh, you know, if, if there's something irrational going on in AA, I still have to defend it because this is my team, this is my people, this is my tribe. Uh, I can't call out right or wrong any longer. My team and tribe tells me what's right or wrong and I have to defend it no matter what. Uh, and that to me is a product of the us versus them mentality. They'll, they'll divide you all the time in AA with, with things like... Uh, Normal people don't talk about having blackout drunks and everybody laughs about it. You know, in other words, they're saying your conversations, the things that you talk about in AA meetings, you can't talk about to anybody in the real world because the people in the real world just wouldn't quite grasp it. Uh, and what they're really doing is further segregating you from all of society because truth to be known, I don't like when it comes to drinking, for example, I don't go around talking about my drinking experiences to anybody any longer. Oh, I did when I was a cult member. I, I don't like admitting to it, but yeah, I did that. You know, uh, I remember, and this is so embarrassing to, to revisit this, but I remember if somebody brought up drinking or something like that, I might say, well, you know, I, I have an allergy to alcohol. I break out in handcuffs if I drink too much. Or, oh my God, that's so cringe. When people said that meetings towards the end, I would just cringe over that, but I, I would say stupid shit like that. Uh, <clears throat> In today's world, like, as, you know, me today, the current version of me, the contemporary version of me, I don't know. But for the past several years since leaving AA, I don't make any bone. I don't really do a lot of talking about drinking. I, there was a young guy one time at a job, and he said, uh, it's Friday, and we're going to go out, and we're going to get smashed tonight. What about you? you? You ever do that? You drink any? And I said, well, I used to. Uh, I don't really much anymore. And I, I didn't say I quit drinking or any of that stuff. I just said, I used to. Um, I don't do it much anymore. And, you know, he asked me why, which is,
believe it or not, something that's not going to happen very often. But I said, well, I said, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The older you get, the harder it is to shake off those freaking hangovers. Those hangovers will just kill you when you get older. And of course, being a young guy, he said to me, well, that ain't going to ever happen to me. It's party, party till the day I die, you know, which... I didn't have no problem with him saying that. I mean, I, I thought the same way when I was his age. No big deal. But I don't make a deal out of it. I just say, hey, I used to drink. Don't really do it much anymore. You know, hey, uh, your whole entire life centers around the fact that you were a drunk, that you're always going to be a drunk. And really and truly, being a drunk or being a former drunk is central to your very existence in AA. It's the central focal point of your entire life. And when you make everyday conversation and everyday meetings and everyday, the people you interact with, the, the sponsors, the other AA members and all of that, if that's the only topic of conversation you've got that glues you together, the, the tie that binds you, that, that permeates your ideas, you're thinking, I'm saying you, I'm talking about me really, uh, that permeated my ideas, that permeated my thinking, it permeated everything. Everything was about me being a drunk and not being a drunk any longer. Uh, it, it was just in my head. It was part of my lingo. It was part of my language. It was part of my makeup. And uh, I didn't make a, a, a conscious decision when I left AA. I didn't make a conscious decision to say, I'm not going to use this, these, these, these slogans, these cliches, these, these, you know, I'm not going to use these words any longer. I'm just not. Uh, because it, it actually kind of worried me a little bit uh, at one point because I, I would hear these little slogans pop up in my mind and I was and I just was adamant I'm not gonna uh, try to think in these terms anymore I can't pinpoint the exact moment uh, that one day I just realized I wasn't thinking in slogans any longer and I, I can't pinpoint the moment where uh, I wasn't thinking in cliches any longer but I realized uh, that the mentality of being around that particular uh, oppressive cult environment all the time colored my perceptions of reality, the way I looked at the world, the way I thought about things, uh, the way I observed things, even the way I reacted to things. It was really, I think it's it's more soul poisoning than I, than I even was aware of for a long time after leaving uh, even. It's kind of like a little funny story. I remember my oldest, uh, my oldest sister let me babysit uh, my niece her daughter one one week this has been years ago i mean the my niece is almost grown now that's how long ago it's been but she was with me and my girlfriend and uh, i remember my oldest sister calls me up on the phone and she just reams my ass after she's been with me she's like she was only with you for two or three hours and she gets home and she's talking with her hands and she's saying this is fucking bullshit i don't put up with you know and i was like well, well wait i don't know i wasn't paying attention <laughs> you know, but but it, you know it, it it, it, she was just, you know, being a little kid, she was just adopting my attitudes, my language, my my profanity, which, uh, you know, I've watched all the videos of me on here before, but I was like, well, you know, I wonder uh, how many how many times I can say an F word in a video with that. I wasn't really consciously doing that. It was just kind of slipping out. It, it does it in everyday life with me sometimes when I'm, when I'm emotional about something uh, normally, but... It, it, it very much like it rubbed off on my niece like that, which, you know, I had a laugh about that with my girlfriend at the time. I said, she got home and she's, uh, she's already, uh, talking like me. She's got an attitude towards authority like me. You know, I remember my oldest sister was like, well, what is she going to do next? She's going to have on a t-shirt and jeans and a cigarette in her mouth, hanging out on a corner, waving her hands and insulting the world and all. <laughs> but it was in retrospect, uh, when I was, I don't remember exactly when I look back upon it and I realized that AA thinking, uh, that AA language, it actually uh, wormed its way in, inside of me and it was, it was affecting my behavior, my reality, my image of myself, the way I looked at myself, the way I looked at the world. It, it was poisoning everything, uh, literally. And I don't remember a conscious point in time where I realized I was no longer thinking in those kinds of slogans and those cliches and, the, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and I, I don't remember any conscious habits that I adopted in order to overcome that. I just, I knew I didn't want no part of no religious cult any longer, just like I didn't want any part of the religion of my youth any longer. And I, I just made a big break with it. Uh, but the the vestiges, I guess, vestiges, vestiges, I don't know. Uh, they hung around and then lingered a little bit longer than I, I, I think uh, I was aware of even. 
the damage that's done by being full of dread and doubt and anxiety and, and terror that you're going to get drunk at any given moment if you don't uh, obey the cult religion, that lingered with me long after I had left AA. Now, I, I've seen people who were raised in really ultra-religious backgrounds like I was and stuff like that that'll say, oh, you'll never get over religious thinking. It'll always be there. Uh, and I've seen people make arguments about everybody thinks religiously whether they want to or not. Well, no, I, I don't agree with that at all. For one thing, religion doesn't have the corner market on ethics, okay, or morality uh, whatsoever. It, 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 it's not the arbitrator of what's religion, of what's moral and what's ethical or any of that. I don't find anything moral or ethical about religion whatsoever. I'm talking about the extremist religion, I, the extreme angle of religion as it was forced upon me. I'm not... I'm not shitting on your faith if you, you know, if you are a religious person watching this, but I'm just saying, you can, it, the same thing with the cult. I've seen people say, I'll never be able to deprogram from AA completely. I've seen people say that online or something like that. That's just 100% not true. Uh, is, if you're aware that that insipid poison is inside of you that the cult gave you or, the, or whatever, uh, religious or political or whatever undertone has warped you in some kind of way due to an association with a with an element or a cult religion or something like that if you're aware that it has altered your thinking then it, yeah it can definitely be easily overcome I think it's been overcome not a hundred percent in my case but I can say that I, I generally tend to analyze uh, some things uh, when I when I have these emotional reactions from time to time but to be honest, uh, the longer I'm away from AA, I, I kind of just, uh, I kind of accept myself for who I am. And that's something I never could do in AA. I was always trying to say, I'll, I'll never be good enough. I'll never be uh, this enough. I'll never be sober enough. I'll never be spiritual enough. I'm an inherently horrible human being filled with character defects and flaws that cannot be overcome. I don't look at the world like that today. You know, I look at the world like, you know, I'm just another guy trying to do his thing and get by and get along. Uh, and I put these videos out there in the hope that other people who are struggling with these same exact problems uh, can identify with what I'm saying and find their own way out. And how, wh whatever you do, uh, whether you choose to stay in a cult or whether you choose to leave the cult, you know, is not uh, ultimately going to be influenced by anything I say. It's just, but I'm just letting people know there is a way to live alcohol-free life, or if you want to moderate, I don't choose to moderate, but it can be done, that it, it's possible to live freely without being trapped or ensnared in the whole entire 12-step world, the sick world of the 12 steps that I was talking about in my last video uh, in regards to supermarkets and such. Anyway, those are just some random thoughts. If you never saw Donnie Brasco and you like mob movies, check that one out. I just thought it was one of the best. Until next time.